Welcome back. I hope you're enjoying this um, seminar series as we are. My name is Michelle Foreman. I'm the Department Head of Nutrition Science here. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mary Beth Terry. Dr. Terry is a professor of epidemiology at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. Um, she has degrees in econometrics from University of Washington and then her doctorate in epidemiology from Columbia and has been there ever since, um, conducting a, uh, extraordinary research around two threads. One is in breast cancer, breast cancer risk groups, um, and cancer prevention, and the other is the research across the life course. And as she has, uh, her research has evolved, it's, it, it's intertwined these threads of life course and breast cancer and high, the high risk offspring of breast cancer into an assessment of identification of um, risk factors for breast cancer in families. Um, and she's very well known for looking at hybrid study designs in epidemiology in an intergenerational fashion, which is very important when you think about life course research and you want to identify when during the life course you can actually uh, find a vulnerable window for cancer prevention, something that may occur way later on in life. Um, so she has... Um, had um, numerous uh, awards and um, trains um, an extraordinary cadre of graduate students and postdocs. Um, she is affiliated with the Columbia uh, Cancer Center as well and uh, in cancer prevention. And the title of her talk today is The Role of Intergenerational Studies in Informing Cancer Prevention. Won't you help um, welcome Dr. Terry? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a thrill to be here at Purdue again. And um, thank you, Dr. Farrar. Um, I really enjoyed the last um, uh, uh, day, a little under a day. And uh, the poster session in particular was really thrilling. Um, so, so today, um, and thank you, Dr. Wells, for your brilliant lecture. I'm going to. Um, uh, you have presented um, such a great overview of chronic disease generally. I'm going to talk just um, about cancer specifically with um, uh, really the example of breast cancer and thinking about how we can uh, design studies uh, for this kind of challenge when you have rarer outcomes um, and long induction periods. So are my slides cut off a bit? I can't. Yeah, okay. Um, so I looked at your mission statement, Dr. Ferrer, and I have to say um, we've done lots of exercises over the um, past few years at the Cancer Center, our department, our school. I loved your mission statement because I knew just by reading it um, that it already was going to be a very interdisciplinary group that really is focused on uh, real world impact and applied um, studies to really um, make an impact in terms of public health and clinical care. And so um, I hope in my presentation of cancer generally and breast cancer specifically, um, I can um, you know, present some of the applied ways that we approach these kind of challenging problems, but just as important, learn from you. So I like the combination of the research and education, because I think particularly for people who are invested in uh, solving lifelong um, problems, they really need to always be thinking about how to train the next generation, because often these problems um, are started by our mentors and are finished by our mentees. So thank you for your vision there. So really, if we think about the basic um, problem of cancer, cancer is a disease of aging. Of course, we know the older we get, um, we're more likely to have cancer. But the younger you are when you're diagnosed with adult onset cancers, the more aggressive your cancers are. The other aspect of cancer, despite um, billions and billions of dollars invested in treatment and care and screening, is that really we have a very crude indicator then of how to pick up people for these population screens. So we can do it on chronological age. Hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll realize, um, you'll, um, you'll be exposed to ideas that it's really not um, chronological age, but it's really physiological age, and how can we best study those kind of aging processes, and that's where I feel like I'm in the room of experts, so I'm hoping to learn from you as well um, in the years to come. So really, we have this crude detector of family history. So how do we offer screening to young 
um, people. If, if it's prior to population screen, such as age 50 for colon cancer, and this year, uh, in the United States, age 40 for breast cancer, we really just use family history, despite all the advances in what we know about molecular um, biology. So this is why intergenerational um, studies are key. So you've been exposed already to a lot and through your own research, um, you're well aware of um, this idea of family history is both genes and environment. And in particular, when we think about cancers that um, are predominantly in one sex or another and genes that can be passed down through the paternal line, the benefit and, and the need to have good quality data from intergenerations um, is essential. And just as important, it's essential to have not just the quality genetic data, but as was presented um, uh, earlier by Dr. Wells, is the idea of really good quality um, environmental data. So this um, pedigree on the right uh, really uh, looks like it's a, um, a cancer family history uh, you know, that's, that's pretty strong. But then if you think about the shared environment, it's not so strong. So what do we actually need? Life course studies are incredibly important for um, diseases that are more common, like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. The challenge with rarer outcomes like cancer is that when you just have information about family history and you, you don't have information on what those relatives did in terms of their environmental exposures, actually the pedigree on, my right, on the right is my husband's family, which looks like he has a very strong family history, but in fact it's all because of the secular differences in smoking. Um, that are seen across the parent and the grandparent generation. But seldom in these health studies do we ever ask about um, environmental exposures and behavioral factors in the parents and um, certainly not the grandparents. So epidemiologists, um, and particularly cancer epidemiologists, are always intrigued by um, uh, twin studies and also then um, global data. So I'm going to show you um, some recent twin data and then also um, show you some recent global data. So this was published this past year, and um, uh, really you can't um, dispute the numbers. It's the largest <laughs> twin study that's ever been published on cancer. Um, and they had close to 200,000 twin sets. Um, so they had sets of dizygotic twins, they had sets of monozygotic twins. And really, you know, what you can see first is the cumulative incident of cancer now. If we go into um, 100, is still only about a third. Um, so it's obviously rarer than some of the other chronic diseases. But um, the dizygotic to monozygotic split um, really is interesting because at about age 60, which um, uh, uh, you can see clearly with these um, curves, you see this kind of um, uh, um, increase between the dizygotic, which share 50% generally, and the mono, monozygotic, which share um, almost 100% of genes. Uh, you really see this uh, increase that then is very stable across the rest of the ages. And so I'm going to talk. and. Um, I love the um, evolutionary biology perspective that was presented earlier. I'm going to show how cancer biologists are thinking about um, these changes then in terms of somatic ma um, maintenance. So the second thing epidemiologists like to look at a lot is global patterns. So what's very unusual about this um, is really if you look at the top, um, I'm sorry, it's a little unusual when you um, uh, set up, so I hope, um, uh, I hope I'm clear when I'm um, uh, referring to different aspects of these slides. But on the top, uh, what, what you can see quite clearly is the, um, the uh, cancer that's most um, common in men is prostate cancer now worldwide. And you see that on almost every continent, um, except then you see lung cancer still mostly in Russia and, and China. And obviously in women, you see breast cancer. And so the one aspect I'd point out um, about this, which is different and has changed over the past two decades, is these are both hormonal cancers, and these are both cancers that um, are very much affected by earlier life exposures and hormonal environment. Um, and prostate cancer, as you know, we don't have a really good population screen for, but breast cancer, um, you know, in many countries um, in Western Europe, the U.S. and um, Australia use a um, pretty much systematic screening for mammography starting at age 50, but you can see now um, the increases across other continents as well. So back to the twin study, what's interesting, um, I thought, is that um, uh, what they're able to do is obviously parse out the heritability aspect as well as the shared environment. And what you can see is for breast cancer in particular, if your twin was diagnosed with um, breast cancer, you have a 20% lifetime probability 
of um, getting cancer yourself. And if your twin was diagnosed with breast cancer, but your twin was monozygotic, you have a 30%, 28%. So, so not a huge increase over and beyond that. And so again, pointing to the shared environment um, uh, aspect of breast cancer, as opposed to um, the estimates for prostate cancer as well. Um, and of course, then contrast that with lung and colon cancer, the other common cancers, where you see a much more stronger um, association for lung uh, cancer with a shared environment. So um, one of the um, other uh, interesting aspects that's been happening um, in breast cancer is a very dynamic increase um, in the incidence. And again, this goes across every single continent. Um, you, um, from uh, Africa to Latin America to Asia. I would just point out in North America now for the first time ever, the rates in, in white women and African American women are converging. And these are rates overall, not just early onset. But across the world, um, what's happening with breast cancer is it's not just um, a disease of aging, because a third of all breast cancers around the world are happening under 50, whereas in um, Western Europe and the US, that number is closer to 20%. So you really see this very strong increase across very diverse cultures, very different reproductive patterns. Um, and so again, this is pointing to things that have to change more rapidly, not genes, but genes, um, uh, but environments that interact with underlying susceptibility. So um, a year or two ago, there was an interesting um, uh, commentary in Cell looking at this question of rethinking the way we um, uh, think about the aging process in cancer. And you know, for many years, this idea of a linear increase based on aging with mutation um, accumulation was thought to um, describe ca uh, cancer. But now, as m more societies are um, aging and living longer and longer, you can see that the cancer incidence um, in red there, it's a dotted line, uh, is really um, not mapping at all to the mutation accumulation. And in fact, most mutations, well, a large uh, number of mutations are occurring much earlier in life. Um, and then um, what's thought is that there's uh, really this uh, somatic ma um, maintenance, which then as, as you age later on, um, aspects of that then break down. And so what's interesting is the aging process, again, not represented by chronological age, but more physiological age. Um, is really mapping much more closely to cancer incidence. And so what I would suggest based on this is that we could learn a lot from early onset cancer, which may have signs of physiological aging that would um, give us better tools to be able to think about how we screen and treat cancers um, than just looking at chronological age. So then um, very briefly, I'm going to just uh, go through three main areas. One is really how can we think then about the role of the environment? Because we know the environment uh, must be explaining these changes and trends. Um, second, how can we think about better ways for a rare outcome that happens mostly later in life? How can we think about better estimates of what's going on early in life to help predict these changes? And then, excuse me, what it is that we all want, which is better clinical risk assessment, how can we target people better so that we don't overscreen and we don't overtreat, um, because that also has a very big impact on the quality of life. Um, OK, so again, the challenge we have here is that this is a rare outcome. Most diagnoses are later in life. We have a long induction time for most cancers. Um, and so how can we think about um, the better study designs, and how would we estimate this? So for many years, people who cared about the environment and breast can uh, cancer generally really did studies in average risk individuals. So these are large cohorts. Um, sometimes they were case control studies, but they were really not enriched at all based on a family history. And we know many, many causal factors on the right. These are non-disputed causal factors for different cancers. What's of interest is, you know, there's aspects of behavioral um, lifestyle, uh, hormones, viruses, uh, ionizing radiation. So they really span the um, uh, gamut in terms of what can actually um, change cellular um, uh, processes. But they were really estimated in observational study, not randomized controlled uh, trials, 
and they were estimated in average risk individuals, so not selecting based on a family history. Whereas everything we know about genes in cancer really come from these large family-based studies. And we know lots about genes in cancer. I mean, the P53 is one of the most important genes for most cancers, including breast cancer, the retinoblastoma genes. But now there's hundreds of genes, many of them related to how you uh, repair damage from DNA. And, and again, these genes are incredibly important because uh, we all walk around being exposed to carcinogens every single day of our lives, but these genes can help um, our body respond to and repair the damage from those. And so many of these genes can be changed in your germline, and that's where um, it's important to know your family history, but they also can be changed epigenetically based on um, environmental influences uh, during uh, intrauterine period as well as early life. So given that we know that there's genes that are important and there's many environmental factors that are important, how can we better get at predicting cancer? It really gets to this question of how can we um, really study gene environment um, interactions in an efficient way. And so what's been done, um, for the most part, is go back to the studies on the right that um, have all these environmental data, and let's look at the genes there. And so um, here I just illustrate on the right um, a very large study. It was a million-person study that was done in the UK. So nobody could argue with the sample size. But basically, it was flat, and there were no gene environment interactions detected. And this is just to illustrate there's been lots of attempts to look at gene environment interaction in average <laughs> risk individuals. The flip side is to let's take a very enriched group of people and let's look for environmental um, influences there. So it's, it's um, less seldom done, but it's, it's an interesting way to think about could we get more power. And on the left side there is a study that we did about a decade ago looking at smoking within BRCA1 and 2 carriers. So again, the cumulative risk um, is, is really high for um, anyone with one of these um, highly penetrant genes, but again, you can still modify that risk through lifestyle factors. So uh, what's been changing really the most um, uh, in breast cancer, particularly in the US, has been a very rapid increase in early onset breast cancer. And so this is something that's happened over the past 10 years. And um, you know, to some extent, public health has ignored it a bit because it, it, it's happened before we screen. Um, so this has been in women under 40. Um, and to some extent, people have ignored it because it's not the bulk of cancer. So when we care about public health, we usually care about numbers. And, um, but I would argue if we want to care about etiology and understanding you know, what's really going on um, that's relevant to women who get diagnosed later, but um, is maybe a better place to look for detecting the signal. Um, this increase in risk overall is about 2% per year, which, um, uh, again, is, is over and beyond what the National Cancer Institute uses to define an epidemic of cancer. And it's actually 3% in um, black women in the U.S. So the rapid increase in, in women under 40 over the past 10 to 15 years has really been Again, not explainable by screening, because this is not something that you screen for universally. So, so the question then is, well, what could be going on? And so the, the thing with breast cancer is most people say, oh, well, we can't modify risk because it's all reproductive factors, and we wouldn't tell people to change when they want to have a kid and when they, uh, um, you know, how long they're going to breastfeed. But that being said, there's many other estrogen mimics that um, have been shown in laboratory studies. And um, on the bottom left, I just show um, one from the head of the National Institute of Environmental Health Study coming out of her lab. But then what has um, gone wrong in epidemiology is over and over again, when you look at these large cohorts um, and case control studies that have looked at environmental risk factors, and this is just on the right, um, PBDEs, which is a flame retardant, which a lot of people are worried about with, with a lot of cancers, but breast cancer as well, you see fairly, I mean, there's some outliers, but you see fairly um, consistent everything hovering about one. So what's going on if the epi studies can't reproduce what the, um, is going on you know, um, in a basic uh, lab in terms of looking at some of these estrogen mimics? And um, clearly, if we're looking at increases in incidence on every single continent and in, in cultures that have, um, you know, uh, uh, are ha uh, still have babies young and, and multiple babies, so you can't explain these variation in, uh, in the incidence by uh, reproductive patterns. Uh, it must um, be other aspects of the environment. So the, the challenge really has been that most studies have really 
um, failed in terms of breast cancer in two main ways. The first is really that these average risk cohorts don't really have enough people. Um, it's a rare disease that really are more homogeneous when it comes to risk. And if we're trying to detect a signal in a gene environment uh, interaction, we need enough people that actually have um, underlying susceptibility and just um, changes to their DNA uh, repair genes in order to detect this. And also, most studies fail to look at when the breast is actually changing um, in function. So what we've spent probably about the past um, 15 years on now is trying to look um, in families for environmental signals. And so um, here, um, I just highlight, uh, you know, um, uh, twins themselves and how beneficial they can be for, for looking at the contrast. But again, um, if, if we think about even the studies of twins with methylation and changes um, in uh, many genes that are important to cancer, there are clearly um, uh, ways that we can look at uh, uh, life, um, um, life course environmental factors by looking at these contrasts within families. So we've been, um, again, mostly doing um, studies within these high-risk registries. So these are all individuals who have substantial amount of cancer within their families, and most clinicians would tell them the cancer is caused by their genes. And we all know um, that even though these cancer genes are incredibly important, none of these cancer genes are 100% penetrant. So we don't have a situation where cancer is a genetic disease like Huntington, where the question is, when is the age of onset? We know that cancer is modified by other genes and modified by the environment. And so um, comparing sisters who uh, were diagnosed with cancer um, early in life compared to their sisters that um, did not get cancer, we saw that the sister that did get cancer had higher levels of oxidative stress markers, they had shorter telomeres, they had differences in their methylation profile, and in particular, the sisters themselves that had cancer diagnosed um, mostly premenopausally had DNA repair phenotype capacity. So we were able to look in their cell lines and, and um, you know, damage, um, uh, use a damage, DNA damaging agent and then see how quickly their cells responded to that damaging agent. That the um, sisters who had cancer actually had the um, DNA repair phenotype of much older women. So this is really suggesting that it's, again, not a chronological age, um, but a biological age. And so what is driving their poor DNA repair capacity? And can we actually use this to um, identify women much earlier in life for then more frequent screening um, that would be more beneficial and, um, and, and more targeted to, to those women? So in the graph there, you can see the yellow line are the, are the women that had breast cancer. And again, these experiments were done in their cell line, so they're not affected by the treatment um, that they had for breast cancer. So another aspect that we've been really interested in is in looking at you know, what, what the International Agency for uh, Research on Cancer would call true carcinogens. So polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are lung carcinogens. They're actually thought to now be involved in a, a number of different cancers. And you know, there's, um, it's a class of compounds that um, is increasing um, uh, you know, across the US and many different environments. Um, and we get exposed to um, uh, PAHs through diesel exhaust, through airplane exhaust, through ways we cook. And again, the challenge with all this is, is to measure this well and to measure it um, uh, so that it can um, then be uh, associated with a, a rare outcome. Because most people find um, reporting of environmental exposures, except for um, things like cigarette smoke exposure, very hard to do. So we started looking about 20 years ago in an average risk cohort. And some of this work was work I did um, uh, with the PI was Dr. Gammon. I, I had the benefit of doing this as a graduate student. And um, what we looked at, again, this was way back when, so you could look at a single SNP here and there. We looked at um, different SNPs in DNA repair with this idea that um, we weren't seeing a very clear dose response association with a blood biomarker for PAHs. But if, if you were more susceptible, we were seeing a stronger association. But again, this association, um, was still fairly weak, but, but um, we had looked at a case control study that had breast cancer cases from 20 to um, 100. So it really was very heterogeneous when it came to underlying genetic susceptibility. 
So what we tried to do recently um, is really then to understand for each woman in our um, high-risk registry, what is their underlying polygenic risk so that we could, again, look at the environmental influence once we were able to um, account for the differences in genetic susceptibility. And so one way to do this is through an individual's pedigree. And so um, there's a clinical risk model. It's used a lot in Europe and Australia um, and a little bit in the U.S., mostly in, um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. But it's a model called Bodicea, and it um, predicts an absolute breast cancer risk based on a woman's um, family history. So you can see on the left, she has no family history, so that would be an average risk woman. In the middle, she has just a mother. And then on the far right, she has a mother and a sister, so um, she has a much higher uh, risk. And you can combine this family history with uh, genetic information. And so we have information on whether or not individuals are BRCA1 or 2 carriers, and then we have information on um, a variety of other breast cancer susceptibility SNPs. So we can get a better estimate of their um, breast cancer susceptibility. So, so we've done that now, and um, what you can see, this is a cohort we have of about um, 18,000 women, and on the right, highlighted in pink, um, are all the women who meet this cutoff, and it's a clinical cutoff in the U.S. In the U.K., they use a 30% cutoff, but in the U U.S., we use this clinical cutoff of 20% lifetime risk to define high risk. And what's on the x-axis is her Bodicea score. So this is based purely on her pedigree and on, her, um, uh, on the genes that we would know. Um, and again, keep in mind the family history is going to capture some of the shared environment as well. But you can see that even in this high-risk registry, and they were all recruited about 20 years ago, primarily for genetic discovery and primarily to find at that time BRCAX, which has never been found, as many of you might know, um, because uh, there's um, many other genes have been found, but they're lower in penetrance, and um, uh, th you know th there's much more complex um, uh, genetic architecture. But um, in any event, what uh, all of these women clinically were found through their family history. So clinically, they would all be defined as high risk. So clinically, they might all be called in for genetic counseling, and they might all be called in possibly to have a risk-reducing mastectomy, possibly to be put on hormones early in life. And so um, these are, you know, um, uh, in, in terms of a clinical sense, all really thought to be high risk, but what you can see is there's a continuum. So, um, you know, the interesting aspect is even within these um, high-risk registries, there's a lot of people, and they're highlighted in the left, that are really average risk. So again, these are people who have a family history, but the family history may be, um, you know, a relative who was diagnosed at an older age. And uh, so again, what you can get with some of these family history cohorts, is, uh, you know, that are uh, enriched based on the family history, is a nice distribution that it gives you enough statistical power to look both at the high risk reflected in pink and um, the more average risk reflected in uh, yellow. So we did that. Um, recently, and what we did is um, looked at, in their blood, uh, markers of um, PAH, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, this pollutant that's very common, uh, and then looked at any um, interaction potentially with their underlying risk, re reflected by this risk score that's based on their family pedigree. And what we found was um, uh, really a very strong gene-environment interaction, so unlike some of these other studies where you see these kind of weak associations, no clear dose response, we saw a very clear dose response, um, again, for the women who were high exposed and high genetic susceptibility um, based on this Bodicea model. And so again, uh, using it as a proof of principle that you don't need large numbers to be able to detect gene environment interactions, you just need more of a homogeneous um, uh, background in terms of, uh, or variation in, in so that you can detect some of these signals. And so um, what we found was really if, if you were highly exposed and also had a high uh, susceptibility, we saw associations that were three to fourfold um, increase. So, so in general then, um, what, um, uh, what this would support is really that some of the um, uh, studies that have looked at environmental factors and uh, interaction with genes, really, if they are not enriched for um, underlying uh, family history, they don't really have um, enough power and precision to detect some of these environmental uh, signals. But 
Just like we found with genes, even though the genes were found in these high-risk families, those genes are still relevant to people without a family history. And in fact, BRCA1, which was found in these family models, um, is thought to be um, altered in as many as uh, one-third of all breast cancers. So just because the genes are found in these families doesn't mean it's not relevant to, um, to all women. So um, second, I just wanted to then very um, briefly um, uh, show you some of the work that we're doing now in the next generation of girls and trying to um, uh, uh, estimate really what's going on early in life and is there um, things that we could prevent um, in terms of their risks. So um, as um, Michelle mentioned, I had spent a lot of time looking in more of these average risk life course cohorts um, and looking at uh, many of the um, aspects of um, early life influences that were presented earlier in terms of thinking about maternal weight gain uh, during pregnancy, maternal body mass index, rate of growth um, earlier in life. And as was mentioned in the question and answer period, uh, cancer is actually very interesting because some of the early life risk factors have um, an opposite pattern to cardiovascular disease and diabetes, whereas the adult risk factors actually have a very similar pattern. Um, and so really, though, what we're, we're interested in now is asking if what we learn from these average risk cohorts is relevant to girls um, at high risk, and what can we learn when we contrast it to? Because that might have implications in how we think about um, uh, doing cancer prevention in, in these girls with a family history. So um, the breast itself changes a lot during the fetal period and, and uh, pubertal period pregnancy and perimenopause. The puberty period is actually quite an interesting one because that's really when carcinogens, um, in particular, um, are thought to um, uh, have a, a big impact prior to when the breast cells differentiate later on. And, and humans are very different than other animals because they develop their breasts years before they um, uh, lactate. And so what um, has been happening, less so with age of menarche, but definitely with um, age of breast development, um, has been a decline over time. And so the age of menarche um, has been declining, but at a slower rate. Um, than the age of breast development. So if you look back the last 50 or 60 years, there's been quite a, um, a strong um, uh, decline in age of breast development in many uh, cultures. And so um, the, the difference then between the blue line and the red line is, is the time after the breast starts um, initial uh, budding, if you will, and before the girl goes through menstruation. So this is a period, particularly in animal studies, where the breast can be very susceptible to carcinogens. It's also referred to as pubertal tempo. Tempo. And a couple years ago, a UK cohort actually um, was the first study to show that independent of age of menarche, independent of height, that this pubertal tempo actually had a 20% um, increase in, uh, in breast cancer risks. So what we've been interested in then is can we look at the contrasting what's happening in girls that are from these high-risk families to girls from average-risk families. So we have a cohort that we've been following the last five years. Um, and we follow them every six months. We collect anthropometry information. We collect um, uh, blood and urine to measure a variety of environmental exposures as well as hormone exposures. Um, and then the measurement, and this has um, been the challenge um, for figuring out how are we going to measure normal breast development and how are you going to do it in girls where half the girls may have um, greater susceptibility to DNA repair uh, genes. Uh, how are you going to do this without exposing the breast to radiation? So some adolescent studies, there's been two now in the world, um, they use um, kind of a DEXA measurement, but again, that's exposing the adolescent breast to radiation, and we know that we have half the girls are high-risk girls, so we didn't want to do that. So with our collaborator in Canada, um, who's a physicist, he developed this optical uh, spectroscopy measure, which allows um, us to start at age 10 when the um, uh, the girls can give their own assent to measure, just using a light source, uh, different components of the breast. So we've been doing that now um, over time. And uh, just like we did with the adult cohort, we have a distribution now in these girls um, in, in terms of uh, their underlying risk based on their family pedigree. So we can look at these kind of G by E interactions based on this underlying risk score. And what we've found so far is that um, the girls with a breast cancer family history are developing their breasts earlier than girls without a breast cancer um, family history. So this is a, in a, um, you know, a cohort. It's a small cohort of about 
um, 1,000 girls, but 500 of them have a breast cancer family history and um, 500 don't. And I should say that of that, um, uh, the half that do, um, about two-thirds of that have a first-degree relative, which means their mother, and then the rest have just a second-degree relative. And so what we're seeing, too, now um, are differences in uh, their hormone levels as well um, over time. So we looked at a higher maternal pre-pregnancy BMI um, and greater gestational weight gain, which has been looked at um, for other chronic diseases. Um, and we looked at this in terms of early breast development. And you could see that there's both an um, independent effect of maternal BMI um, as well as maternal weight gain on having an earlier age of breast development. But then when we stratify the cohort based on whether or not they had a family history, um, that signal seemed to only be in the cohort without a family history, even though the cohort with a family history had um, an earlier breast development. So we, we've been looking now a little more closely at um, hormonal differences. And um, again, um, uh, keep in mind that the girls with a family history, only a minority of them are actually going to have BRCA1 and 2 mutations. Only about 10% of high-risk women even have BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So when we say a family history, this is not just because of any one or two genes. This is, this, um, is really um, an environmental effect as well as um, uh, uh, you know, uh, genetic effects. So it's, it's, it's capturing both of those. So, so we're interested in um, thinking about then the role of what's going on in the home environment and can we pick up some differences in particular with androgens, which you can measure pre prepubertal and also reflects um, and are altered by um, stressors in, in the environment. So um, Dr. Foreman actually has done a lot of the critical work linking preeclampsia, um, the inverse association with preeclampsia and breast cancer risk, and that's a very consistent um, association that's been seen in a lot of different cohort studies. Um, and uh, so um, one of the aspects of... Um, Preeclampsia is that you have a different androgenic environment from preeclampsia. And androgens themselves um, have this relationship where um, later life androgen <coughs> levels actually can uh, increase your risk of breast cancer because androgens, um, particularly postmenopausally, um, but androgens themselves can, um, are precursors to estrogen. So, so you see this um, uh, uh, inverse association that then becomes positive. And so we've been measuring now um, the androgen uh, uh, profile of the girls to see if it alters their timing of um, uh, breast development. And, and you can see that DHEA, DHEAS al um, alters their uh, breast development by um, half a year. Um, so we're seeing uh, within the girls that are um, uh, high DHEAS, uh, an accelerated um, uh, pubertal onset um, from girls that are lower. Um, and that's similar to what Dr. Foreman's been seeing in, in her cohorts as well. And um, even though DHEAS was not different between the girls with and without a family history, we did see other androgens that were different in girls with a family history. So what we're following up now uh, with this longitudinally is to see, um, and androcene dion in particular um, had a very strong, um, uh, stronger association when we separated out the first degree and the second degree relatives. Um, uh, from their family history. So um, we're working on trying to understand then um, uh, changes in androgens based on the timing of the mother's diagnosis um, because that obviously changes the home environment. So um, again, just thinking about how we can measure this objectively um, because um, you know the challenge of, of trying to understand what's going on with breast cancer much later in life is to kind of understand how the t tissue architecture is changing during normal development. We've been now serially looking at um, these optical measures um, uh, across adolescents starting at age 10 and seeing um, differences in these um, optical measures that actually can help predict uh, Tanner stage um, and uh, different components of the breast tissue really reflecting changes across those Tanner stages. Um, and then um, really um, uh, seeing differences by breast cancer family history uh, reflecting uh, differences in collagen levels in the breast tissue in the normal adolescence. So, um, so uh, thinking about then how these biomarkers then would be used um, for early onset screening 
This is um, this optical measure now we're trying to, our collaborators are trying to use in a low resource setting and we're trying to do the parallel study in um, young women 20 to 30 to see if we can use these optical measures prior to the onset of, of really increased incidence so that um, you don't have to use um, you know, MRI and other kinds of um, methods until the peak incident happens. So it's a way of kind of supplement screening, if you will, but having it accessible to people even without a family history because it's, it's a um, low cost method um, and very reliable in predicting the different stages. So um, then in just thinking about um, uh, uh, what, you know, how to link what's changing um, in adulthood to what's going on earlier, um, we are seeing earlier uh, breast development in girls with a family history than girls without. Is this because of the stressor of having a mother diagnosed uh, with breast cancer? Again, keep in mind these are um, half our cohort. When the moms are diagnosed, they're diagnosed, um, you know, under 40, under 50. So um, again, the home environment, um, the behavioral scientists on our team are following up with that. Is it a difference? Is that home environment changing their androgen profile? Um, and then really in, in terms of thinking about how um, we can monitor this over time, having this objective measure that's relatively low cost and objective in terms of predicting the different stages of breast development is key. So finally, I just want to close with then what our ultimate goal is with any of this research, which is um, it's interesting to link you know, exposures early in life to diseases later in life, but really unless it can change how we target individuals for screening and prevention, um, uh, you know, we haven't um, had a maximum impact until we can think about that. So there's two ways we're using the early life data with um, clinical, um, uh, uh, clinical tools is really by extending now how we uh, think about predicting cancer. So um, not just breast cancer, but all different cancers have um, basically uh, these risk models that are fairly um, uh, similar in terms of how they um, predict disease. Um, you know, some uh, delineate based on whether or not they include uh, second degree relatives. Some just only have first degree relatives. Um, some include mutations, they don't. Some have the polygenic component. But so far, the, the only models that really have risk factors, non-genetic risk factors, are those that really have captured these um, you know, hard to modify reproductive factors and haven't really included um, uh, these other um, factors that we know might be driving the, the changing incidence. So, so uh, what's going on clinically is that um, it's really uh, grouping people into if you get a high risk family model or if you get an average risk model. And so most people without a family history uh, would be given an average risk model, and, and uh, most people with a family history would be given uh, a model that's been de developed in high-risk women. What we found, though, is that this model with pedigree data actually works even better in average-risk women as well, that we don't need these two different models, that it's better to have what we know as um, the best of what we know in terms of the underlying biology and the genetics as well as the non-genetic factors into one model. So um, we've been looking then at um, how to, um, prospectively, how do some of these models predict the outcome? And again, we're seeing um, here the diagonal would represent um, if you're over the bar, it means that you've observed more than what the model has actually predicted. And so we get a better fit um, from uh, these models when we use the models with non-genetic factors, but when we use the pedigree information. So when we use the information from multiple generations, even in, in the settings where we don't know that, the model itself, based on um, the underlying statistical assumptions that are used in it, um, are better fit than these average risk models that most people assess based on the, um, uh, uh, just counting your ne number of relatives. So um, real quickly then, what we did most recently in our adult cohort is look at the fit of these models that are used every single day in the clinic and um, really, the, even though overall they do quite fine in that the observed to the expected are okay with some of these pedigree models, um, the Gale model itself underpredicts um, when, when you factor in um, family history in our cohort and that sort of thing. But the challenge here is that they underestimate risk in the low quantiles and they overestimate risk in the top quantiles. So even though on average they do fine, 
the um, the women who are higher risk are being told, you know, an estimate that's that's uh, too high, so they may be making decisions about risk reducing surgeries. But just as problematic is the women who are low risk are really not um, uh, are not getting um, screened early enough. So again, this idea of chronological age as opposed to um, really a, a, a model that improves based on um, you know what we know in terms of the risk factors is, is probably where we should go with um, thinking about screening. So, and that is what we're doing. We're using now, um, based on the, the um, information we have from both the adult cohort as well as the kid cohort, using these um, uh, blood biomarkers that we can measure then uh, different um, biomarkers such as DNA repair phenotype and uh, DNA um, damage as well as the non-genetic risk factors from early life. So um, then just in uh, conclusion to show you really the impact, um, a cancer like breast cancer, um, most people again think are not modifiable. Graham Colditz in his work has shown that you can modify it again by starting in midlife, but most people can't actually, um, the kinds of things that you would do in midlife, most people actually can't make those changes in behavioral factors in midlife um, because it's, um, it's just very difficult to change things that you've been doing for several decades. So if you are able to start much younger and things like physical activity patterns, diet, nutrition, alcohol um, intake, all of that, then you can have a much bigger impact on the trajectory of breast cancer risk. So if we know all of these things and we know that lifestyle factors matter in midlife, then how do we actually do this um, and, and can we intervene? So um, in closing, I'll just show you um, a trial that we're hoping to start uh, with our behavioral scientists at Penn, which is really um, trying to um, get out the information that we know um, uh, to affect cancer risk to those that are at highest risk. So, so we know that most women uh, really already tell their kids about cancer family um, history, and so these kids are exposed to this. They have questions about this, um, and so um, they really, uh, you know, are asking about these questions prior to age 25, which is when clinical care would do any kind of testing for them. And um, what they're not getting, though, is any information about prevention. So in our own cohort, um, what is happening is the girls with a family history are actually starting to smoke earlier than the girls without a family history. And so, again, they're given the message that their cancer is from their genes and not from their shared environment. Um, and so we're hoping to, um, again, stop this because we know that, um, that that isn't really the case and that even in BRCA1 carriers, you can modify your risk by not smoking. Um, and so these are really um, big issues with then how things get applied clinically when, um, when we know that the reality is much more complex with the interplay between um, the two. So um, we have this um, e-health intervention that we tested now. It's, it's actually to do cancer prevention in both the moms and the girls, including the moms that are not from the cancer family history um, families. And so um, we've pilot tested it and we hope to launch it soon and, and we've had some good uptake from it. Um, and so uh, in uh, closing then, really, uh, if we're thinking about uh, how to improve how we assess risk, we know um, aspects of risk that are not included in any of these clinical risk models. We know that the environment matters. We know that early life and adolescent factors matter. We know that it's an interplay between these two. And none of the current risk models actually even include this interaction. Um, so uh, we are um, uh, planning um, to include these interactions and then um, validate the model in our prospective cohorts. And then really, if we want to improve breast cancer pre prevention and all, we have to really think about how we can improve these clinical risk models, but also then methods to communicate early enough for maximum prevention. So I'd like to thank my collaborators and um, really encourage everyone to think about um, you know, the importance of both genes and environment and uh, in always knowing your family history. So thank you. And I just, I noticed something right at the end that I found very curious and I was surprised by. She said that the girls who come from higher risk families in terms of breast cancer 
are smoking earlier. Do you think that's an effect of SES, or do you think something else is going on? How do you, how do you, if you please speculate on how you think can account for that? Yeah. So they're they're probably um, uh, well. So they also have reported the girls with a family history also have reported higher levels of anxiety. Um, so the SES between the girls with a family history and without in our cohort is you know fairly similar. So it's it's not um, that's yeah, not a big, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a really great talk. I enjoy it a lot. Thank you. And um, like, I'm like in this in this talk, you are like mostly talking about like screaming for the risk of the cancer. But I'm like wondering like there are, is there any like study like showing like the prevention like after screaming for the risk of cancer is the like screaming and really is there any like prevention like really helps for them to reduce this risk? Like if like there's no study showing that, like then what's the point of like screaming for higher risk if you, we cannot do anything to reduce them? Then I think uh, kind of follow up is this. I kind of know like in the and uh, the I like not I know like I heard from like the, in the literature that um, for the breast cancer is I feel like there are more you can do to try to reduce this risk. And what about the other cancers? Is there are some other cancers like? Like there's not really like much we can do to reduce this risk. So yeah, yeah no, it's a great question. So for cancers generally, um, the cancers that we have population screens for include colon cancer, and that's a very interesting screening tool because actually through the screening tool you remove the uh, precursor lesion. So it's a very effective population screen. Um, uh, you know, some countries do just half the colon the, through a sigmoidoscopy, and some do the full colon through a colonoscopy, but it's a very effective screen. But your question is really important because, you know, if you have something to indicate higher risk, but you have nothing to do about it, right, that also, you know, is a controversy should you be doing that. And genomic screening is actually something like that. Should you be do doing genomic screening when you may not have an intervention? So, um, so colon cancer, the screen is also an intervention. Mammography, the screen is not an intervention. So it's not as if um, you're extracting any kind of tissue from that. So, so um, the big question really is, uh, by identifying people at higher risk, does it reverse or um, improve prevention? And so for high-risk individuals, again, it's dependent on the cancer. For breast cancer, uh, the most effective screen, people will tell you, is to remove the organ. So you can either remove both breasts, or it's, it's uh, controversial, but some people rem will remove both ovaries, um, also for added protection for breast cancer, although that um, most recently may not uh, give you that much protection for breast cancer because it's not occurring early enough. But that's really, um, and, and then chemo prevention options are, are available for very high risk. The lifestyle interventions could potentially increase a lot, you know, uh, could reduce a lot of cancers, but unless you start them early enough, they're not, it's very hard to change people's lifestyle in midlife. So they really have to start early enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So have you considered or is it likely that... Hi. Is it likely or have you considered that the feedback to the girls, I don't know if they're getting the feedback, that they are higher risk genetically and lower risk environmentally, that that feedback could have any impact on their decision to smoke and their behaviors? Yeah, so that's possible. That's what we're looking into. So what we have right now is observational data, and the, the RCT is really, the educational tool is, is designed specifically to educate on G by E kind of interaction, that yes, your genes matter, but also your environment can modify that risk. Because none of the genes for cancer are 100% penetrant. Yeah. I loved seeing the um, picture of the mother and daughter sitting around a computer trying to learn. Could you tell us a little bit about how you are working on targeting that message sure. to young women? Yeah, so this is work. Um, so our um, 
our collaborator team is also very interdisciplinary. So we have um, a group of behavioral scientists. So they've done a lot of the work in developing the instrument to be um, really, uh, uh, it's an educational um, uh, e educational tool as well as um, it, it addresses kind of coping mechanisms and things like that. And so the mother daughters do this together and um, and they've gotten, it, mostly have done a lot of focus groups to, to perfect the tool. And um, the big interest is in making this scalable. So um, uh, that would be the goal of the trial. So we're, the trial itself, it would be in 600 girls and randomize the intervention and then delay the intervention for the group that doesn't have it right away. And then we'll be looking, you know, at um, different measures of uh, behavioral, um, you know, anxiety, that sort of thing. We'll also, uh, our group does more of the environmental exposures for this study, so yeah, you know, we'll be looking at that. That's a good intergenerational model of interactivity right. socially right. as well as. Right, I mean, this is something where, I mean, for many years people thought, again, I like the discussion about the hierarchy and, and not having a hierarchy, but people always thought, well, cancer is a hierarchy, right? So you inherit cancer from your parents. But the reality, especially with thinking about the increase in early onset cancer, is a lot of young women are getting diagnosed, and now their mothers are getting diagnosed, right? So you, so it's not necessarily so. So it's it's a kind of interesting, um, uh, very dynamic change because the increase in early onset cancer is occurring pretty rapidly. Yeah, yeah. So I love this idea of um, not chronological age, but physiological age. Do you have any information on um, like the DNA repair age like process in puberty? Is it yeah. already showing? It's a great question. We're trying to get that funded. Um, so part of so so DNA repair um, genotypes, right? There's you know, lots of genes you can put into a polygenic score and get your DNA repair genotype. But that only explains a real small portion of phenotype. So we really still don't have, well, we don't have any real good longitudinal data on how DNA repair phenotype changes over life. But we do know older people have worse DNA repair phenotype. And um, early onset cancer cases have a lot, you know, lower levels like they would be older. But um, the big challenge has been there's not been a high throughput assay to be able to do it very quickly. So um, David Brenner, who's in radiology at Columbia, he's designed this rapid throughput um, assay that he uses now um, basically um, for um, uh, you know, very rapid response, like um, if he's trying to understand who's most susceptible from radiation exposure, right? So, you know, like what happened in Japan, he, he, his field team would go there and they would say, okay, these people have worse DNA repair, so you have to target them for more screening. And that's what we're actually hoping to do both clinically for women, because uh, you can be a BRCA1 carrier, but still have pretty good DNA repair phenotypes. So, so again, the idea would be let's give radiation to people who their phenotype is good and can repair the harm of it, and let's not give it to people, you know, who their DNA repair phenotype is not good. So we're hoping to do it in the kids, and so yeah, we have a grant pending for that. But yeah, so we'll see. But but it would be of interest to know if any kind of environmental exposures can alter that, because right now most people think DNA repair phenotype is mostly described by genetics, but. I think we haven't really had enough evidence. Yeah. Would you like to uh, estimate the contribution of obesity to the incidence of human breast cancer? Because that would never be detected or estimated by any kind of gene environment interaction study. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And in fact, you know, the twin data that I showed earlier. Um, <clears throat> Right, so that if, if your monozygotic twin was affected, you only had a 20% probability, but if your dizygotic twin, you only had a 30%. You know, does that reflect the fact that these, um, you know, there's a lot of environmental influences, or does that say it's just a stochastic process, right? So, so I, I think those two things are still possible, either one, right? Because So, you know, the controversy that came out a couple years ago, they didn't include breast in that article. Do you remember that, Michelle? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, the um, breast, partly because of the developmental aspect of the tissue, I think, um, uh, you know, people are thinking that um, a lot of these early life factors, if, if it's the influence is going to be on the stem cells, and then later in life, you might see that through um, clonal expansion. But the challenge of looking at that in any kind of long-term health study is really difficult. But you're right, it could, it, that's still a plausible hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. So I'm struck by the way that this conversation is going um, about how the environment can influence DNA repair and some of the other uh, components that you're looking at genetically or epigenetically. And so when I think about um, the biosocial pathways internally, um, fat is one of the most plastic and morphic tissues that we have. We know that obese girls have menarche early, they have breast development early, um, they may not have menarche early, but they have breast development early. And in the androgens that we're starting to see and they're profiling, um, maybe what we need to start to see is looking at the profiling of the androgens within BMI or waist circumference or some other bo uh, body composition marker of fat and fat deposition to see whether fat is really playing this role through the aromatization pathway um, of androgens to estrogens or however right. to modify some of the gene effects. Yeah, and I mean, PAH is at least in mouse models as well as some other environmental exposures have also been shown to be obesogens. You know, the human data also shows that, but I think people think that could just be confounding. But the mouse model clearly shows that um, pH exposures can increase your um, uh, adipose tissue in the mouse, and then, uh, you know, the, the uh, prepubertally, you'll have a lot more exposure than to androgens. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I was really struck, I'm, I'm a cultural anthropologist and in part an end of life researcher, and um, the part about where you were describing now, you know, the, the, the increase in daughters having cancer before their mothers, and even the, the name of the study, it's called legacy, which implies that you're gonna hand something down. I'm wondering if you're gonna have, or if you have plans to have any kind of more targeted behavioral um, intervention to support this happening and, and, and sort of all the, the social aspects of people trying to deal with something that they might either not have seen before, or be less familiar with, or, or is less culturally expected, and kind of what is being done, not just to think about on the clinical side, but how to support, well, partly in the clinical side, but how to support people in that situation. It's a great question. Yeah, no, that, that would be um, an important area. I know um, because, uh, the family interventions for cancer um, have really taken some sort of uh, lead from cardiovascular disease interventions, which have worked really well. And, and some of the work I saw this morning at the poster sessions, you know, your partner um, helping. The, the breast cancer, just because it's um, most of the interve interventions so far have been sister-based, and the sisters don't necessarily live near each other, they haven't been that um, effective. <laughs> Um, uh, but the mother-daughter um, intervention, it's a great idea. I mean, yeah, it would, it would, um, it would certainly be um, important to know. I mean, I think the, uh, the young girls now, the idea is this is a time, too, when a lot of the um, you know, lifelong behaviors are also um, being influenced. So having a mother-daughter intervention at that point would be important for both, both groups because it is too, too difficult to try to cha change some of that later in life, yeah. Let's thank our wow, this has been good. Each year, the Center on Aging and the Life course uh, confers an award, and the award uh, rotates across three different parts of our uh, mission at Purdue University, research, teaching, and engagement. As you may recall, uh, last year we honored Dr. Wayne Campbell from Nutrition Science for his research excellence, and this year 
we're going to focus on teaching of our uh, graduate students. To select the award winner, we survey our graduate students and we ask them to list faculty they identify as, quote, an outstanding or excellent instructor. Uh, the students identified eight faculty associates as outstanding, and I think Tracy could hear me uh, shouting with joy when I, when I got that information. It was just so amazing that we'd have eight faculty in our program that are identified as outstanding. It's just remarkable, so we're, we're really grateful for that. Uh, but about half of our students mentioned one a person who happens to be our awardee. Uh, we also then consult with the uh, faculty to uh, get additional information about the uh, candidates. And the selection committee this year was thrilled to have so many well-qualified candidates. And it's our pleasure to confer the outstanding uh, professor award on Dr. Elliot M. Friedman. Elliot is the William and Sally Berner Hanley Professor of Gerontology in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. And after reviewing their comments, I'd like to hone in on three qualities that really made this candidate uh, stand out. Number one, welcoming and inclusive. And let me give you a few quotes. Dr. Friedman fosters a warm and welcoming classroom is receptive and flexible in thinking about and discussing topics. Another, Elliot is excellent in the way of giving you the feeling that you belong in his class, even if you think you don't know anything about the topic. <laughs> Second, he's clear and an integrative scholar. Quote, Dr. Friedman is able to clearly explain and expand upon many concepts and processes related to aging from perspectives in multiple disciplines. And I kept seeing this word clear, clear, clarity, clear. It would just popped up over and over again in the comments. Thank you for being clear. And third, he's a mentor. Uh, one student remarked, I think he's a great mentor in addition to being a great instructor, and a little editorial uh, comment too, as well as a great researcher. Uh, Quote, I feel extremely lucky for having taken two of his courses and getting to know him. And I, I can say, let me uh, add that a couple of my students have had Elliot on their committee, and he is a coveted member of doctoral committees. I'm sorry, I'm going to get you more uh, requests now. But, you know, it, you, it's just obvious when the dissertation defense goes on that Elliot is extremely well prepared. He asks very constructive and thoughtful questions, but he's also very resourceful. So you can tell he really enjoys this thing called being a, a professor. Please join me in, in welcoming and honoring Elliot Friedman. Um, this really is an honor. Um, Ken and I were talking before the festivities began in the poster sessions, and we both agreed that this is a pretty great gig, um, and particularly teaching the Calc students. I mean, I really never have to work terribly hard to get them to think critically and engage and talk to one another and, and bring in all kinds of interesting ideas. Um, it's also a real treat to teach these students um, because of the multidisciplinary nature of calc and the classes that, that calc offers are bring in multidisciplinary students. And like I say, it's a great gig. I get to learn all kinds of things from them as they look at the kinds of things that interest me but bring their own eyes and their own perspectives. And the, the discussions that we have are incredibly rich and uh, it's, it's great fun. It's one of those things where you walk out feeling, I, I can't believe I get paid for doing this. This is just a great time. Um, but it's, it's an honor just because I, I also have a lot of affection and respect for these students. Um, they're really remarkable people, and so I 
thank you, I thank Calc, but I thank the students in particular for uh, nominating me for this. It really is an honor. Thank you. Wow. Feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. There are a few things that I need to remind you about as we head down the home stretch here. Uh, first of all, I think it's been a great morning. I hope it's been a good morning for you. I want to thank our speakers for really excellent lectures. This was so stimulating. And even the speakers were mentioning the poster session. There were some awesome uh, poster presentations there. Thank you for being here at 8 o'clock and for, for introducing our uh, theme for the day. Uh, I also want to thank, again, our sponsors, our co-sponsors, Nutrition Science, Anthropology, and PURA, the Purdue University Retirees Association. There are a lot of people that work to make this uh, event happen, and Tracy Robison is standing right uh, against the wall there. <laughs> Tracy is the assistant director of the Center on Aging and the Life Course, and she handles a mountain of logistical details, and she does it extremely well. So you made it very comfortable for us, and she, she's just so very thoughtful and, and does her work with excellence. Thank you. There are also timers and people who are, who are uh, doing cleanup and roving mics. Thank you. I mean, a lot of people put into this, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the evaluation form. So in your booklet, there is a form there for evaluation. So we literally uh, get feedback, and we hope to tally that information and discuss it at our steering committee meeting, I think, this coming Wednesday. So, so we really do want you to take a moment or two to fill out your evaluation and turn those in. We also will recycle these name badges. So there's a basket out there where you can drop your, your uh, name basket, or your name tag, excuse me. And then finally, uh, peek at the back page of your booklet. So on the last page of the booklet is a list of upcoming colloquia and events. Uh, we welcome you to those events and wish you optimal aging. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>